Good afternoon. I am Henry Hatter. I'll be your co-host today, and I have with me today uh, George Moss, a longtime education leader in the city of uh, Morris and Flint. So, uh, George, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Who are you? Where you graduated from? Uh, what gave you a quick rise to dominance in this community? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'm from Birmingham, Alabama, originally. And uh, anything I've accomplished in education, I give credit to my teachers. I am a Mrs. Reed's student, primarily, my 12th grade English teacher. And I give her credit because I write in her name from what she did in one of her classes. I wrote two papers, um, <clears throat> and she called me to her desk, and she called a person by the name of Adolph Davidson to her desk. And she said that um, we had copied the papers. She thought that we had <laughs> copied from a book. Now, I had written Adolph Davidson's uh, paper. So she asked him, she said, Adolph, tell me what's in your paper. And Adolph Davidson couldn't tell her because he passed it without reading it. And then she turned to me, she told him to go sit down. Then she turned to me and she said, Moss, what's in your paper? And I began to tell her what was in the paper. And she said to me about a minute into the discussion, she said, okay, you wrote it, go sit down. Now, I could have gone back to my seat and had an attitude about having been falsely accused. But there were 15 minutes in that class period, and I went back to, to my desk, and I sat there in, for 15 minutes, and I was absolutely in awe of myself. Because I had a lot of respect for Mrs. Reed, and I knew if she thought that I copied that paper, I knew then I was pretty good. And so I've been writing in Mrs. Reed's name ever since, because she helped me find my, my gift. And so on Facebook, where I'm on Facebook every day, I'm on Facebook because I write in Mrs. Reed's name now. And I make sure that all the T's are crossed, all the I's are dotted, because I'm representing. And I feel like I'm representing in anything that I do. Uh, I come out of a tradition, a, a very great tradition, a very in, a intellectual tradition in the black community. We are kind of, uh, at that time, we're still kind of celebrating the ideals of Booker T. Washington, who was an I ideal uh, in education. Uh, Washington had uh, built a school at 25 years of age in Tuskegee called Tuskegee Institute. It's a school that George Washington Carver, who had finished Iowa University, had come to teach there. And he was also trying to invite W.E.B. Du Bois, who he'll have, who he'll have some problems with later on. But can you imagine that triumphant if there had been a combination of Booker T. Washington there, W.B. Du Bois, the intellectual who had been the first person to graduate from Harvard University, he was there, if he had been there, and have the great George Washington Carver there, that triumphant would have lifted black America up almost single-handedly from one institution. But anyway, to make a long story short, we were still in that tradition when I was in school. And what I heard for 12 years in the educational system was that I had to be twice as good. And I sat in those classrooms for 12 years, and I kept hearing this over and over again. Every teacher would say it. It didn't matter what class you had, whether it was math or English or science. Every person was saying that. And I never could figure out why that was true. They kept saying you have to be twice as good. But because I believed the teachers, and I knew that they cared about the students, and they really did love, these, love the students in their classrooms, because their idea was to bring the group forward under some very dire circumstances, I believed them, and so therefore what I was doing in the classroom was working very hard because I was trying to be the person they said I had to be in order to get through some of the barriers. Didn't know what the barriers were at that time. But what I give them credit for is that they didn't waste our time talking about the problem. You see, one of the things we're doing right now is we're overwhelming students with the problem before they have the tools to deal with it. What they did was they put the tools at the forefront, and they had us uh, working to be twice as good, getting our lesson out, doing a lot of homework, Affirmative action, by the way, because homework is affirmative action. No matter what they say about it now, affirmative action is not doing things that don't have uh, in back of it advancement and merit. You have to have merit that advances a group. And so this idea of affirmative action being something that you have not qualified yourself to, to have the benefits of is nonsense. Affirmative action is homework. And if you do your homework, you are affirming... That's an interesting perspective. That affirmative, mm -hmm. that affirmative, affirmative action is your homework. homework. You have to do your homework. Yeah and qualify yourself so that whatever the barriers are, you don't have to have anybody to give you an additional points because you've earned the right to be there by your own merit. 
And so they kept telling us that over and over again. And I didn't quite frankly get it in terms of why am I qualifying to be twice as good as someone else and what's the reason for that? I didn't find that out until quite frankly I went to uh, my first um, university. I finished uh, Knoxville College in Tennessee um, from 1962 to 1966. But when I finished that school, which was um, predominantly black school, the Pres Presbyterian school, private school, but I went to Wayne State University, which is my first graduate school, and somehow in Detroit. in Detroit, and somehow the students found out that I was from the South. And during the break, in one of our classes, during the break, they all came to me and said, George, we heard you came from the South, and you came out of this environment, and there was segregation and so on and so forth, and we feel so bad for you. They didn't know my training. And so I told them this. I said that um, you don't need to feel bad for me because I was in a school where the teachers were very serious about their, their mission. They were on a mission. And they told me for 12 years, and I did believe them, that I had to be twice as good, and I worked very hard to get here. I'm not here by, by any kind of, of uh, person giving me something I didn't earn. And when they give the first test, what you're saying, you feel sorry for me, and when, you, when they give the first test, I'm going to be in the top five. I won't be in the bottom of anything because I've been trained to be here. And um, So you had a resolve to get there. I had a resolve to be there. And no, George, no, we're going to come back okay, to that because all right. we got to move on. Okay. i got some good questions. <laughs> okay, for you. love the questions. And I think that you will be up to the challenge of this. <laughs> uh, the first thing I'd like to know is, do you think this training did prepare you today to speak on social issues, on public issues, on political issues? Uh, do you feel that you were well prepared to do that today as you're going to, as we go through this? You get prepared through your educational background and also through experiences. I, I think one of, the, one of the things that they did for us is to teach us the three R's, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And from that, you have a foundation to do a lot of other things, but the springboard for being aware and being politically involved and in anything you have to say out there in the public limelight is because of the uh, training that you have. And I give everything, I always go back to my training, and my training was such that what I say in public, I try to make sure that it does have content to it. And I uh, make sure that I'm uh, not out here just simply, just mouthing a lot of words that don't mean anything. So I think, I think that, yes, I, I think I am qualified because I do a lot of reading. That's another thing, too, in our background. We didn't have a lot of television sets in the neighborhood I was raised in. There was like one television set in the whole neighborhood. So we all met over this person's house during the time we had the cowboy pictures on. And then we would have to do what? I mean, we didn't have TV in our own households, so what did we do? We did a lot of reading. And I did a lot of reading, and I just went through a lot of books, read all the classics. By the time I got to uh, high school, I had pretty much read the classics in the comic mm -hmm. book form. So today, when I do commentary, and I write the longest posts of anyone in the country on Facebook, my posts are the longest ones. Everyone says that. And they say, well, we, we want to find out how do you, you, you're a wordsmith. Well, I, that's my training. But uh, when I comment, I, I do the research first, and then when I get on, the, on, the, on Facebook and write, I've done the research before I write anything, and, and I think that's what well, qualifies I, me to I, do, do what I'm I mean. hoping that the young audience that's in K-12 now is really listening to you. Now, I have a question that will challenge you. Okay. Why is it that African-American students continue to be the lowest performing student in public education? Not, not challenged, first of all, and, and given the and idea... I hope everybody heard that question mm -hmm. because the, a That's lot a of people need to weigh in on this and many times we're afraid to attack this question. They're, they're, not, they're not challenged um, and, and uh, they're made to feel that they, are, that they cannot qualify themselves and so oh, therefore... By whom? By, by the system, by everybody that's talking to them, by the leadership. This idea that, they have to, that you have to be affirmed by someone else, you have to affirm yourself. You have the same, t uh, blacks have the same talent that any other group has, and it can be as competitive as anyone has ever been. And I can tell you this, I, I've, been, I've been to Egypt, and I went into the pyramids in Egypt. And those pyramids were built by pharaohs. First of all, the, the first pyramid, I was in a place called Saqqara. That pyramid called the Step Pyramid, built by a, per built by a person named Imhotep. 
was built in the third dynasty of Egypt. It's a very primitive pyramid, but in terms of having learned from that experience, and then of course you build on the experience you already have, in the fourth dynasty under the pharaoh, who was the second pharaoh of the fourth dynasty, a person by the name of Khufu, K-H-U-F-U, Khufu, whom the Greeks called Cheops. And that pharaoh built the pyramid that was so admired that that's the pyramid that's on your dollar bill right now, in the back of your dollar bill. That pyramid is in a place called uh, Giza. It's on the Giza Plateau. I have been inside that pyramid. My point is that before this idea of this debilitating circumstance that, that, that blacks had, this idea of it being debilitating, slavery, that as if it was something unique to the black experience when slavery is everybody's experience. Yeah. Everybody's experience. There's nobody on the on the planet yeah. or who will ever be on the planet who does not have slavery in their background. But in terms of how it's taught, it's taught as if it's a single event that happened to a single group with a single victim and a single victimizer. And the way that they taught, teach that, it, that's, that's incorrect. And so, it, it, so the, the idea is that there's something that has debilitated uh, blacks that has not debilitated other groups. And therefore, the effort is different. When I was coming through school, the effort was maximum because that was not what we had in the forefront of our instruction. Our instructors were telling us that we could do. But you're saying that the cause is the system. But we have, in, we have influences given to us by our parents, mm -hmm. by our institutions, right. the churches and our neighborhood schools. and the, Why haven't they made a more positive impact on our students so that they perform uh, to uh, meet the challenges of other students. Henry, don't look like them. Henry, uh, uh, everything goes back to the family. Everything goes back to the family. There, there's a story that Walter Williams, Dr. Walter Williams tells, and he talks about how his teacher called his mom up to the school, and his teacher was saying, your son has done this, and has done that and done the other thing. And he got ready to say, no, I did And before he did this, mama bopped him in the mouth. Now, I know that's child abuse today. But I'm telling you how it was when we had yeah. correction in our community. And there were standards we had to follow. And the children knew what the standards were. So his mother said, did this to him. And said, what are you doing? Call a teacher a liar? Well, see, that's, if you, if you have that in the, as the way the community operates, that the adults are the ones in charge. You get one result. When you, have a, when you have another idea that the youth who are the least experienced are in charge, you get another result from that as well. And the result we're getting right now is that we flip the switch in terms of the adults have abrogated their responsibility to raise the children and be a voice for them and use your experience as a guide so they don't fall in the ditches that you know that are out there because you were once in those ditches yourself. And from experience, you can make sure others don't get in there as well. That's why the Bible says, for example, that you should honor your father and your mother that your days shall be long upon the earth in which the God has given you because if you don't honor them, you don't listen to them. And if you don't listen to them, you fall into the ditches. You probably notice that our numbers are exploding in prisons right now. That's the reason why it's, why it's occurring. What should we be doing to improve the lot for black children so that they can perform and can compete with other kids of the world? The Chinese, the Japanese, the Indians. Uh, the whites and so on and so forth. Blacks can be competitive and you, we have to first of all know, you know, a, a people know what they can do by what they've done. And you have to be aware of what your achievements are. And what I would do in my classes, by the uh, to start out, I, I taught black history for, um, I think I was the longest, uh, I think I taught black history in public school for a longer time than anyone else has ever done in the history of the United States. I did. I taught black history longer than Carter G. Woodson did. did. Uh, Carter G. Woodson is the founder of Negro History Week, and now it's called Black History Month. I taught it longer than he did. But what I would do, I would go back to the very foundation of civilization. I would show them what black people had accomplished where no other groups were, in fact, accomplishing what blacks did to show them what they were capable of doing through history. Uh, in, in, there were no pyramids in the world no one had pyramids on any other continent other than Africa. The mathematics that's in the pyramid, the Great Pyramid of Giza built by Khufu, that, that um, pyramid has in it mathematics. It even has a mathematical formula of pi. And I would tell them, uh, that because I was in all the areas, I would tell them that pi is 3.14159. 
265. I would take it out of nine places, let them see the math that's involved in it. That if you take one half the um, base of the pyramid and divide it by its height, and the height of the pyramid is 481.4 uh, feet. And you divide it, you get something very close to pi, which was three point, the, Greek, the Greeks got close to it by 3.16. But pi is 3.14159265, and so they got close to it. Their thing was four times eight nine squared, but I would show them how, the, how Egypt had gotten to it before that. And because the Greeks were the first intellectuals in Europe, there were intellectuals before Europe that preceded Europe, and they went into Africa where the first intellectuals were, and they were listening to those teachers. Not that the Greeks didn't have their own thing. I try to make sure my students do not come out with an idea that only black folks can do this. I want them to understand we can all do it. So I would tell them that the Greeks had their own civilization, but no group can be great just by listening to their own teachers. They have to listen to the teachers of the world. Yeah. And there were teachers elsewhere, and the Greeks were, were curious about the other teachers, and they found when they went down into, when they went I say down, but really down and up has been changed. When you're going uh, down now, you talk about going down south. That's been changed. You used to be going up when you're going south because you're going into Egypt. You're going, you're going up. Yeah. So, uh, but when the Greeks went up to Egypt, they were going to Egypt because Egypt had something that they didn't have. It, did, it does not mean the Greeks did not have what they had. They had something too. But they didn't have what the Egyptians had the blacks that were there, and the blacks didn't have what the Greeks had. So let's be honest and say that both of them didn't have what the other persons had. And both of them should aspire to have that. Because sure, you're a good too. conversation. Let's, let me, <laughs> gotta move on. Um, I, I want to know, what should we be doing different to inspire and promote our kids in the next decade to be better? To be better? To be able to compete with other kids? They're not going anywhere, Henry, without the history. You know, everybody... They, they, asked the, they asked the Sumerians, what happened to the Sumerians? They said, oh, they lost their history, so they died. You see, any people that don't know where they have been and don't know, therefore, if they don't know where they've been, they don't know where they are right now and they, know where they, they don't know where they're going. History, is, history gives you a vision. It is a guide of where you have already uh, been and it tells you also where you have to go. So they have to have a historical rootedness in terms of what has the group accomplished. And we've accomplished a lot. But how many children that's walking around in their days don't, don't know these things? And how many of them, because they don't know, are not inspired to know more? But I like to see uh, many black kids move into the area of erudition, uh, you know, just great creative thinking and uh, postulating ideas and putting together ideas that lead to a end result mm -hmm. that other people can use. Mm -hmm. and, and like, for example, I'd like to see uh, young black uh, individuals be able to challenge pie. Mm -hmm. or to challenge whether light is a wave or a particle. Now, you know, they change, the concepts change over years, mm -hmm. but we've never had anybody even think about that. We need to, there are a lot of theories out there that are probably only close to the truth, but they're not there yet. And we're not getting the kind of students out of the black population that can challenge these ideas, mm -hmm. and we ought to have those. We ought to have it, and we did have it. Uh, there was a school uh, named uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School, and Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School was one of three schools in Washington, D.C., and it was the best school that was there. There were two other schools that were there, white schools that were there. And Paul on Dunbar High School was sending out all these scholars. You'd be surprised when you read down the list of those persons that came out of that school. I'm talking about people like Robert Weaver. I'm talking about Charles Drew, the person that did blood plasma, came out oh, of that yeah. school. He was the, in Chicago, wasn't he? Uh, he was in Chicago. Um, the, who, went, who went to, uh, who later on was a Chicago, you know, physician and surgeon and so on. But I'm talking about the school that put those persons out. Thurgood Marshall was taught by, by Hamilton Houston. Hamilton Houston was the one that, that founded um, Howard University Law School. He taught Thurgood Marshall, and therefore the one arguing Brown versus Board came out of that school. I'm, I'm saying this, the idea there's no scholarship, no model to emulate is not true. We have to teach the model so they know the model exists and then they aspire to, to be that. How do you get teachers to teach that? How do you get teachers to inspire, to, to drive students to creative thinking? 
Uh, I know that they do it in white schools, it's always done, but how do we in black schools incentivize our students? We, got, we, we are not going to do anything, Henry, uh, without there being a grounding point in our culture. You have to have some idea of the race. I mean, the persons that were bringing us forward were race men. I don't mean to be against any group. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you should be against any group. I think you, sh you should. Yeah. But you have to be grounded in terms of the group that you are, in fact, instructing. Black people teach, teach, teach in, in schools that are predominantly black. Yeah. That's just the way it's going to be. And when they're in those. But is, doesn't that uh, kind of condemn them? No, I think. Does, I think, that, does that. Is that kind of a. Uh, a uh, perspective that leads to the fact that our students don't perform as well. Well, we have well you're in you're 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 in the jury you're not in the jury segregation anymore, you're in de facto segregation. In other words, if your community is a predominantly black uh, uh, community, you're gonna have a predominantly black school. You're gonna have predominantly black school teachers in those schools. Yeah. And they have to have some some sense of who's sitting in front of them. And what the mission is for those teachers in those classrooms with those students. What's the mission here? And the mission is to bring the group forward. That's what our teachers, teachers were doing. They were doing this in the, in the image of, of, and persona of people like Booker T. Washington and others. Those, education, uh, those educators were bringing the group forward. And they understood that. And they were grounded in certain understandings they had. Where I went to the classrooms, you heard everyone sounding the same way. They had a mission. I, I'll give you an example in my, in my school. I didn't understand why it was in the gym class. We were running around the gym all the time. I didn't understand why run, and then when we get we get we get a breather, and then the guy would say SOS. We run again. I didn't know until later on when I looked back to see what they were doing, how the gym class was connected to the math class. Mm -hmm. What they were doing was taking our energy down, because children have a lot of energy. They didn't need Ritalin. You need gym class. You need to run around the gym, get your energy down. I hope some of our teachers from Kyle is listening. Can, can, <laughs> you can do that because you don't need, uh, the, kid, the kids don't need Ritalin. Yeah. They, the problem is children can't go outside today in a lot of neighborhoods because it's too dangerous. Mm -hmm. So then they're playing these little games and all sure. of that, sitting around in a chair. And they go to class and they're sitting down in a chair and they got all this energy and they're bouncing off the wall and they want to medicate them. 12 million children are medicated, but our, but our teachers had a mission and they knew how to accomplish that mission. The gym class was connected to the science, the English, and the um, math class and all the other classes because the gym class job was to get our energy level down so we can listen to the, to the, to the math uh, teacher. That's what well, they were doing. I, I got to ask you this. <laughs> um, they want a mission. <laughs> who should be at the table to create change and how we teach our kids and the mission. <laughs> Who should be at the table? Not, not the, we're, let's, we're, we're, and we're going to focus on black children. Yeah. Only. Uh, not the schools we have today. That's turning out these uh, children that, that think they need to be in safe zones. It is it's outrageous what is happening on these uh, college campuses today where everything is about an aggression. If they can't find anything to complain about and, and climb under the victimization rock, then they talk about microaggression. We can't even tell what that is. What is that? That's a new term of victimization, or microaggression. They just say somebody may have said something that you don't like, and now you need to start locking hands and get in a circle and, <laughs> and, get your, and, and, just, and get your security back in. Now you're going to tell me who has to be at the table, because there are people that are listening for your response. We're going to need to have all of the um, community members at the table. Parents got to be at the table, and they're going to understand their role, and that's send Johnny to school uh, with a, a, a well-fed, well we, we want the meal in the child's home, let the parents provide it, not the government. Let the, let the child see the parent providing it. When a child gets there, a child can understand his head is not, he's not sent there to have his head on his desk. He should have his pencil out, and what he's doing is working toward a future that he can develop for himself at his desk. He doesn't have to go anywhere to, um, to affect his future in terms of looking abroad on, on some, some screen somewhere. Johnny is working on his future at his desk, pushing his pencil around and reading the, the assignment, bringing his, his homework in. That's uh, Johnny's job. The teacher's job is to maintain discipline in the classroom. And the pencil job is the back of the teacher. Yes, but you got to have some people who are really know what's going on in the world. You got to have people at the table that can incentivize these uh, goals and objects that we're going to pursue and to uh, lay out uh, the kind of expectations mm -hmm. that we would expect. And we need to bring our expectations down 
in years? Like, for example, what do we expect for your child to do um, three years from now when he graduates from mm-hmm. high school? <laughs> we need to have these kind of planning. I, I never see I those. I don't personally see them mm-hmm. focused on it the, in schools and, you and all other schools are doing that. Mm-hmm. But we have we seem to have low expectations for uh, black children uh, with respect to that's, setting goals for them. That's a killing field. If you don't have high expectations for the child, the child doesn't have high expectations for himself or herself. And so the first thing is to, is to believe in the ability of the children to perform well and to require that of them. You know, I, I used to uh, go in the classroom, quite frankly, when I first started teaching. The first shock I had was when people were telling me, when I called for the homework, they would tell me they were absent the day before. That shocked me. Because when I was in school and you were absent from, from the classroom, you called your friends. And you found out what the assignment was, and you walk in the classroom the next day, you had your assignment. My point is this. We can't lower the standards just because the children are black. We have to raise the standards. Yes, you know I, why? I agree. I agree. You raise the standards. Agree. The reason for that is because what Du Bois said, that a race that is behind must forever re- remain behind unless it runs twice as fast as the races in yes, front. Yes, And so you have to teach the children to run fast. Now, with respect to the, what you've already responded to, um, by 2050, we're going to have People of color are going to be the arithmetic and political majority of this country. They will have tremendous responsibilities Mm -hmm. to hold together the country and to work in unison with other races and other people as we become more and more multicultural Mm -hmm. or uh, pluralistic. Now, uh, what are your thoughts? What should each race of people, and I'm talking about the Hispanics, the, and you may have to shorten your answer, Hispanics, black and whites, what should they be doing uh, to teach their kids or to incentivize their kids for all of the uh, uh, challenges that's going to be ahead of them 34 years. Uh, I'll give you a brief answer of what Malcolm X said. Malcolm X said that tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for today. As your preparation now is a predictor of what you'll be doing in the future. And so we have to get busy. We cannot be around here making excuses. Johnny needs to learn to read. He needs to be do needs to be able to do that well. He needs to be able to compute and do that well. And if he's able to have the skills going to the twenty first century, twenty second century, we're going to be pretty well off at that time. Uh, I'm sorry, our time is coming to a close, but. I would like to have discussed your presidential preference, uh, uh, but we <laughs> didn't sense. get to that. I hope uh, I'll get a chance to yeah. do that. we got uh, about 50 days left before the yeah. election. I hope you'll Look come back and share that with me because I think you have something to say. Uh, and <clears throat> now, folks, uh, the In My Opinion show is coming to a close. Uh, we would like to, uh, I'd like to thank my host, uh, my uh, guest, George Moss, and, uh, and I hope that you will stay tuned in the show. Thank you.